Hello, everyone. Happy New Year. Welcome to today's Ask Industry webinar, part of the SIM 2021 vision series. Today, we're going to be talking about how AI can get more out of medical images. I'm Tessa Cook. I'm an assistant professor at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, radiologist and informaticist, and I'm delighted to be here today as your host and moderator for this webinar. We are very fortunate to have with us today several industry experts participating in the discussion. Conrad Chin is the Chief Product Officer with Blackford. Kevin Harris is the President of CureMetrics Incorporated. Ning Lin is Adjunct Assistant Professor at Yale University School of Medicine and Director of Clinical Research in North America for Visage Imaging. Travis Richardson is the President of Flywheel and Jeffrey Sorensen, the Chief Executive Officer of Terra Recon. SIM members are eligible to receive one hour of IIP continuing education credit towards their ABII certification or recertification for this live webinar. To receive the credit, simply complete the post-webinar survey, which will pop up after the webinar has ended, and a certificate will be issued and available within two to three weeks in the grade section of your SIMU account. If you're not a member and interested in earning CE, Become a SIM member today and more information is available on the SIM website. After the panel discussion today, we will have a Q&A session. Be sure to ask your questions through the Q&A icon found at the bottom of your Zoom control panel. And we look forward to uh, a robust discussion. So without further ado, let's begin. So my first question, is to you, Conrad. You know, there's so many imaging AI, uh, there's so many AI tools rather out there today. And uh, it can be hard for, for users to, to get a sense of what's available, what's useful. How would you recommend that they do that? And, and how can someone that's looking for a solution find an AI solution in particular that will benefit their practice? Well, thanks, thanks Tessa. Tessa. Um, that's a really, really important question from our point of view, for sure, and um, definitely, I think, a challenge for the industry. Um, I, did a, I did a little check just today because we knew we were coming on here, and I think the latest total is something like 79 FDA-cleared medical imaging AI applications out there. And actually, every single one of those clearances really is, well, not every single one, but some of those clearances correspond to products that have multiple variants. So the real number is probably hundreds of algorithms out there with many more in development. So that's pretty hard to get your head around if you're not familiar with the area or if you're just coming to it fresh. Um, so in, in terms of the first part of your question, I mean, how, how can people find out what's available? Uh, there are resources out there. Um, for example, the ACR Data Science Institute uh, maintain a great web page which lists out all of the FDA cleared tools, and I think we'd, I'd really recommend that as a starting point. People may already know about that one. On the um, second part of how do they find the tools that are of value, that's, that's a much more complex question. And I think um, I, I think I would say that, that to start with, with that, that it, like as with any technology purchase, really important to start with your needs. You know, what are the, what are the needs of your facility, your case mix, your most important referrers, your the goals of your practice and your business goals uh, before you start looking at the tools. Um, and then after that, I think people can break down AI tools into various categories. Anatomy and modality is often the case, but, but especially breaking the tools down by the value that they bring. There's a wide range of different possibilities there. So some are, are reading efficiency, some are triage tools for optimizing your work list, some are CAD tools for improving accuracy. Um, so it's this, this categorization of tools is where marketplace companies like Blackford and others can, can help, I think. Um, and certainly we at Blackford spend a lot of time on understanding and categorizing tools uh, to the extent that we, we have a word for it. We call it curation. And uh, it allows us to kind of rapidly build shortlists for users based on their specific situations and their specific case mix and help them move on to trialing and getting value from real tools. Um, so, and, and actually importantly also, so you can identify combinations of tools that might work for a particular service line. Um, so I think whilst marketplace vendors have a role 
uh, I think also the industry can mature in this direction. And, and, you know, we're very supportive of things like the ACR list I mentioned, because I think that can grow to make some of this kind of curation information more public and more readily available for people. So very supportive of that as a company as well. Yeah, and, and you bring up the um, <clears throat> the needs question. I think is is a very important one. You know, we had a, we had a tweet chat uh, about radiology AI recently, and the the question came up. You know, uh, if if a company wants to sell you an AI solution, uh, you know, or if you think you need to go out and buy an AI solution, well, what is an AI solution? I mean, that's sort of the first question: is what are you trying? What is the problem you're trying to fix? Uh, and the value question, which is something we'll we'll get to later in the discussion as well, becomes uh, becomes very important. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. So really important to start with your needs for sure. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I could add a couple there. Um, <clears throat> you know what we've uh, what we've learned over time is that customers really want to experiment within the context of their workflow. So if you mapped out all of these different um, you know offerings that come. Conrad is mentioning, and you just looked at the ones that actually have uptake, they're the ones that actually don't ask anyone to do anything different, right? So uh, I, I hope I, can I mention other companies if they're not not uh, not me? <laughs> because I can give examples, but, you know, like lung, uh, lung uh, imaging for CT with vessel subtraction uh, to speak generically is a good one because the radiologist already knows what to do with it. A lot of the workflow orchestration is, is understood well because they know what the problem is and they already know what should happen and what should ha happen isn't happening and the algorithm can fix it. Where I think that there's been a lot of challenges with the many companies that are out there is that when they're providing a novel insight, it doesn't fit in the workflow. And that's really the problem. So I think I've, I've started to categorize these into you know, point solutions that do something cool and novel. You know, the experimentation never turns into adoption because it's just not possible. So one, one piece of advice that I could provide just out of pure practical experience um, is you know, look at your workflows, look at your problems, look at the available tools, and then start with something that gets you to first value that your doctors don't have to really think about. They just appreciate the result but they don't have to, there's no change management necessarily uh, involved. Yeah, any, anything that takes, you know, an inefficiency in our workflow or a pain point and, and eases that, I think is a, is a good, uh, you know, uh, introduction to, to AI, uh, even in a, a complicated workflow. And I think, you know, it's something I, I sympathize with with all of you as, you know, folks trying to, to develop these products is that the radiology workflow is complex. It is, and it is certainly not one size fits all. And that, that can make it really challenging on both sides, right? Especially if you're trying to develop new solutions and, or if you're out there trying to find a solution that, that fits your practice, for mm -hmm. sure. Kevin, I've got a, a question for you. You know, we were talking about uh, a, a, about workflow and, and those challenges. And, you know, there is some AI out in the clinical workflow right now, although maybe not as much as we thought there would have been by, by this point. Um, from what you've seen, how, how is AI being used in the clinical workplace? And, and what are some of the barriers to entry that still remain? Sure, thanks. From our perspective, it's, it's really important to know that the impact of AI and, and the goal of Cure Metrics is to bring together the powerful forces of AI and the radiologist to better support patients and their outcomes. Um, you know, so the, the tools in the clinical workplace today are out there um, really trying to be helpful, trying to be useful. Um, you take a tool, for example, that uh, helps to optimize a work list like uh, our CM triage. The, the real goal there is how can we better change the clinical workflow? How can we change the patient workflow within the clinic? Can we actually reduce double reads and reduce um, time to read to provide more time for the radiologist to spend time with their customers? So, I mean, there are AI solutions out there that, that are being used both in the diagnostic sense to help improve diagnoses and in the clinical workflow sense. And, and I agree with what Jeff was saying. I, I think that to the extent that you can tie these things directly into the existing operational workflow and give tools to the doctors that don't, don't require extra clicks, don't require extra monitors, don't require extra 
um, e extra tools in their desktop where it becomes more of an automatic, where it's, it's tied directly into what they're already doing on a daily basis. I think that's where the power of these tools is gonna come. Um, we have to be able to build trust within the doctors that, that these tools work, that they work as promised and that they work easily so that they don't create an impediment to actually using AI. Can I ask a question just quickly? This is uh, Travis here with uh, Flywheel. Um, how, how are you guys seeing the deployment of uh, experimental pipelines? You know, like, you know, cause a lot of the AI is, you know, today of course is based around new innovative approaches and may not be a hundred percent clear that it, it's adding value yet. Um, how, you know, what, what are your thoughts on, you know, those kind of experimental pipelines and integrating with existing workflows and, you know, kind of a supplemental capacity or, um, you know, how does that work from your point of view? Well, from our perspective, we don't have experimental pipelines. Um, we actually have, from the day we founded the company seven years ago, we've really focused on building directly into the existing pipelines for the doctors. I mean, when, when we started, we sat with a lot of doctors and asked them what works, what doesn't, what do you want, what do you don't want? Right. And, and I mean, it's silly, but we hear lots of things from these doctors like, I don't want any more clicks. There's already enough clicks. I, I, you know, you walk into these reading rooms and if you're a radiologist, you know this, th these reading rooms are often tiny. They're already crammed with monitors and chairs and, and there's no room for new, new monitors, new, new pipelines. So we've been hyper-focused on building directly into what the doctors already have. Um, we've toyed with an experimental pipeline. Um, and every time we, we try and push something out there where we tell the doctor, look, there's tons of value if you just use this this um, tool, they say, yeah, but, but how is it gonna work right in with, with what I have today? So it, it's really, I, I believe, challenging. And actually, Travis, you bring up an interesting point, which I think is something that, that Jeff was uh, mentioning with our, with our last topic, which is, you know, <clears throat> what, how, uh, when, you try to, when you try to do something that's experimental that doesn't fit into what the radiologist already does, you might meet a little bit of resistance right away or, or maybe even um, pushback. And I'm curious, Jeff, if you all have, have addressed that and how, or you know, anybody else on the panel, if, uh, if you've got any thoughts on that, because that's really an interesting, it's an interesting angle to the problem, right? You wanna, you wanna make radiologists workflow more seamless. You wanna be able to increase our efficiency, increase patient safety, all of, there, there's so many different ways that you can define value. But at the same time, some of that requires innovation and a little bit of doing things differently. And so those are kind of opposing uh, uh, goals in, in, in trying to implement some of this stuff. So I'd be curious to hear what all your thoughts are on that. Yeah, we, uh, it's been a journey for me, I will admit. So, uh, so I mean, to answer uh, you know, Travis's question, uh, I would say we have to find a way, right? I mean, it isn't that physicians don't want to be innovative. And in fact, you know, if you look at radiologists in general, they're very, you know, they're technologically savvy, they're early adopters, they're curious, and they're very frustrated by the fact that, you know, th they know where their workflow is broken and nobody's fixing it for them. So they get very, very, very pragmatic about the fact that I just can't talk to you about cool things until you fix my daily work. Um, however, I think what, <clears throat> so where my perspective had changed was I originally had this theory of a fighter pilot that if you wanted to earn the trust of a fighter pilot in the heat of battle and you wanted to tell them when to fire the, you know, the, the missile, they would never trust you because their life depended on it. But if I put a light, a light down by their shoe, right, and said, okay, you know, in your peripheral vision, kind of, when you should have taken the shot, you, see, you saw the red light, you would slowly earn trust. And then eventually they'd say, well, that's ridiculous. Put it up closer, put it in my visor, et cetera. That just didn't work because the fact is that there's false positives in these tools. They aren't actually perfect. Uh, and if you get one wrong and nine right, they're gonna remember the wrong one because it's their reputation. So where we pivoted was to actually put findings into clinical interpretation that are actually can be adjusted. So they can just blow right by them like the red light. They can utilize them to get an answer quick that's quantitative. Now, the beauty of that is if they're willing to give me 10 seconds, I'm willing to give them what used to be three minutes of work, right? And so there is a value trade-off. So I think the, uh, what we learned was you have to get them to, you have to buy them back time and then you have to get them to be willing to trade their time. 
And that solves that believability problem that we have. And, and I really believe, Travis, that it is where the world is going. We have to have the tools that radiologists use able to do these things, um, you know, and they're really not. And so I would like to see the industry focus there. And I think we could all do better. We have an interoperability problem. We have a workflow problem. We have an explainability problem. And until then, we're going to have an experimentation problem. And, and in fairness, we had all of these problems even before AI. And in a way now having to do this AI implementation is just refocusing us all on the fact that there are all of these other inefficiencies and interoperability challenges that we need to address if we're going to make the AI successful as well. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that, uh, Tessa, that I think AI is, you know, it, it, it brings a whole host of new post-processing tools available. That, 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 but there were already post-processing tools before then, and there were already interoperability issues. And just to pick up Travis's question, I mean, we, we see the same problem as well, and the same problem that Jeff mentioned too. And I think that one additional comment, I think it's always important to go back to what is the goal of the project? You know, if you're introducing a new tool or a new pipeline, what, what are you hoping to achieve? And that, that can vary by type of customer, is it, is it a, an academic site or a, a, a working radiology site where they're, they're focused on throughput? And, and it's, it's really important to, to frame your experiment because then I, and, and make sure everybody understands where you're at. So, you know, if you're dealing with an incomplete piece of technology, everybody understands that, but they know what might be a next, you know, what might be a reasonable positive result from, from this experiment. Uh, otherwise there's always that danger of, of, of disappointment. Yeah, of uh, you know, under promise versus over deliver is uh, yeah. generally the better way to go. Ming, you had some thoughts on the uh, on the uh, experimentation and uh, uh, real world rollout piece of this. Yeah, yeah, uh, exactly. So one of the really neat things that uh, we did in partnership with Yale University is uh, we have a research server, um, same actual software as what's in the uh, the diagnostic platform. And what's really neat is that it's been really helpful to accelerate that translation from uh, an idea uh, Python code into something that can be used at the bedside. Um, and so to give an example is that uh, in one of the research projects, um, one of the neuroradiologists was interested um, in having uh, radiomics uh, measurements of uh, segmentations of brain tumors. Uh, and so that request is made. And because of the, uh, the architecture in the software, uh, where you can dockerize uh, algorithms, et cetera, uh, in an afternoon, we were able to build, uh, build into it uh, pi radiomics. So now it's, it's a button uh, within the PAX viewer itself. And after segmenting a, a lesion, you push that one button, it calculates the, uh, the radiomic features and you can output that as a JSON file. So now that data can uh, actually be exported outside of the system for offline um, training of AI algorithms. And with just a few more button clicks, uh, the, uh, the images and the segmentation masks, they can be exported into nifty file format type. Uh, and so now it completely unlocks the data from uh, into something that is no longer industry proprietary, but rather uh, an open source format. And so that has really helped to uh, allow for the data, the analysis, the annotation and labeling uh, become so much easier and accelerated for the researchers at Yale. Um, and at the same time, um, the radiologists, even just sitting at uh, their diagnostic workstations on the hospital side, uh, they can remotely log in to uh, the research server, which is located um, on the university side. Uh, and so they don't need to physically move. Um, and it's the same exact interface as what's used um, in the diagnostic environment. So same set of tools, very familiar. Um, and it's been so helpful to uh, be able to take uh, ideas and uh, push them into, um, into prototypes, test them, and uh, go for regulatory clearance. Right. And I, I might add just quickly to that one, one element of that that's very important, you touched on it a little bit, is, is capturing the data um, from the various test instances and being able to learn from that, iterate, improve, provide more clarity as to how you got there. Um, and, and, you know, we will, we'll talk a little bit about how we approach those kinds of problems. But, you know, in a research uh, context, building new pipelines and uh, workflows and so on, 
that part of it is, you know, often overlooked. You know, it's one thing to deploy a model. It's another thing to keep track of, you know, how it's doing and how it's evolving and, and those kinds of things. So. And I, and I think that that, you know, that sort of post uh, deployment monitoring has been a topic of, of other webinars in, uh, in this series as well. But, um, you know, one of the things uh, Ming, that you mentioned is, is really sort of unlocking the data a little bit and unlocking the annotations and, and also, you know, putting annotation sort of into the clinical workflow, right? This is one of the challenges of, of building a good AI model in general is, is where do you get good expert quality labeled data? Uh, because this is not something that is inherently part of our clinical workflow and, and could be. Um, Ming, the next question actually is for you. Um, one of the conclusions of the, uh, the recent imaging AI in practice demo that, uh, that took place at the 2020 RSNA meeting uh, is that visualization of AI results really has to be efficient in the clinical workflow. And we've talked a lot about, about you know, adapting to the existing workflows rather than trying to change workflows. But, but how does that results visualization efficiency look to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so uh, first off, yeah, there's a, a great video of the um, Imaging AI in Practice uh, demo that's now available on, on YouTube. Uh, so I, I'll post a, a link to that um, uh, shortly after, uh, after this question. And uh, for us, it's really having a, um, something that's efficient, that's something that is able to uh, fully embed that AI algorithm into the viewer itself. Uh, so that it fits, yeah, naturally and seamlessly in the reading workflow, um, not another separate application or uh, a shortcut to open up um, another uh, software that may be skinned into the main diagnostic viewer, because uh, that oftentimes results in a very disjointed and disruptive reading experience. Um, furthermore, yeah, the ability to show explainability uh, using things like heat maps, for example, um, and the ability to um, record any disparities uh, between the AI result um, and the final radiologist read so that um, any sort of drift or divergence um, that uh, can be proactively captured and examined. Um, and lastly, the ability to use the inference result from uh, AI algorithm one as input to AI algorithm number two, right? So that interoperability becomes really important um, and alongside with that uh, is including the ability to uh, revise the AI results so that that can serve as the new ground truth for continual AI learning. Uh, so that's what we see as the um, that efficiency, how that looks like. Yeah, you, you bring up an interesting point, which is that you know, we always talk about AI tools sort of in isolation, right? Imaging gets done, AI runs, AI does something, radiologist acts. But, but you make a good point, which is that that may not necessarily be the case. I mean, we know that in reality, there will probably be many different AI tools that will process a single data set. And there may also be situations where one, the output of one serves as the input to another, um, perhaps even in a conditional fashion, right? If the output of this AI model is this, run this other model on it. Uh, and so, so that brings up even, uh, even other uh, challenges. Uh, someone else wanted to add something on this topic. I didn't see who it was. Um, well, I have a couple comments. Uh, one would be that, you know, it's interesting to me that I think if you looked at the most productive manifestation of all of this, then you'd have to have a solution that worked inside and outside of radiology. And as soon as you had a solution that worked outside of radiology, you'd start to think about a web-based form factor. You'd start to think about EMR integration. You'd start to think about simplicity instead of explainability, right? And utility and integration to the clinical information. <clears throat> and so it really does beg the question, you know, as you know, radiology is really the, the, the center of gravity in terms of all of these discussions, when you project these concepts to the enterprise viewer and to the point of care, it doesn't really make any sense at all unless you start to build an application for that physician in that context for that specialty. And then if you took that workflow and said, well, gosh, now that I'm thinking that way, how would I think about this if I started fresh as a radiologist? I don't think you'd actually be looking in the context of big monitors with many studies, diverting your eye attention to many different places and sort of welcoming in different products into this workflow and tightly integrating them. 
I think you'd look at it in terms of AI is just a technology, it's not a product, and we need a system to run AI content. It's more like music than it is a product. It's just content that we need to run on something to get a result. And I don't think that the player works very well for an enterprise use case today. So I, I, I think it would be interesting to think about the fact if we've been unsuccessful welcoming AI into the radiology workflow as it is today, what would radiology workflow look like if we started with AI and reimagined it? Because if we have to ask for change, then why don't we do something revolutionary and something incremental when incremental isn't working? Yeah, that kind of gets back to the, the earlier conversation about, about experimentation and, and creating solutions that don't fit into the workflow. Is it, is it because the solution doesn't fit into the workflow or because the workflow doesn't fit what we're trying to achieve with the solution, which is, which, uh, is probably a conversation for another day? Right. <laughs> Travis. Oh, yes. I, I Actually, I wanted to comment. Uh, Jeff touched on something that's actually a really important point here, which is we're, we, you know, most of this discussion even so far has focused on taking imaging, assuming it's a radiologist, consuming that data and the traditional workflow and augmenting, enhancing, et cetera. And what we're seeing, and, we, and again, we focus on research you know, uh, in the research context for helping our customers develop AI algorithms and so on related data management. But what we're seeing is a, a broader trend towards more multimodal uh, kinds of uh, analysis feeding the AI. So correlating imaging with genomics or EMR data and, and so on and so forth with, you know, and broadly what, the way we interpret that is, you know, ultimately you want to sort of get a 360 degree view of the patient, you know, anything that's relevant, how it possibly correlates. And maybe to Jeff's point, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Jeff, but, you know, in some sense, you want to reimagine that whole thing and say, well, you know, how do you prioritize anything that's relevant and get it to the heads up display and, you know, it's a very interesting topic because, uh, you know, we've touched on it very much from, a, you know, enhancing an existing workflow rather than reimagining the workflow altogether. So. I think it's, uh, it's pretty interesting from the, the, the there's, there's clearly kind of a split between um, applications that fit very well into or tools that fit very well into the workflow today, which can add value and, and make reading efficiencies. And I think the, the idea of building them right into the PAX viewer is great because you know th those tools already fit, and uh, we we'd love to see uh, um, a kind of standards-based way for PAX vendors to integrate this stuff and just a list of here are the requirements of AI tools for PAX viewers. But I think you know I I take the point I think from from Jeff and Travis and others that that, that there's a grander vision there as well. Perhaps perhaps in the in the long run, the the shape of workstations needs to change completely because uh, you know because of this disruptive technology. And you know, I think we saw the uh, the first major disruption some some years ago with uh, moving away from film, which dramatically changed the the radiologist workflow. You know, will will AI be the next uh, the next major disruption to really to really rethink the way that we approach all of that now? Uh, Jeff, this next question is for you. Um, and we actually touched on it a little bit uh, in just this last conversation. You know, one of the biggest limitations of pixel-based AI right now is that it excludes the clinical context in many cases about the patient. Uh, and so what could we do if, if these tools actually included clinical context, genomics, other, other metadata about the patient, uh, or maybe even about the patient population in addition to the images that are being processed by the AI? Yeah, I mean, that, that's definitely where everybody wants to get. And um, yeah, I'll sort of pick up on the discussion, uh, maybe from the point where we left off and say that, you know, if you, <clears throat> if, if somehow we could reimagine the workflow, because we'd have the same, right, where that data go, does it go above the report? Does it go in the report before you've reported on it? Does it block your view in front of the images that you're looking at? Um, and so the, the context piece you know, my view there would be it has to be a very, very finite search, right? Like you, you need to really nail the data that you're evoking. And so that requires two things, you know, so, so maybe the best way to respond is to say, well, first, you know, how do you get clinical context, right? Instead of just opening up a fear of, of all of the structured and unstructured health information, we've got to show the relevant information. And the relevant information is actually going to change based on the actual clinical information and what we see in the images. So an interesting approach that, that goes back to pixel-based 
If we try to use pixel-based imaging and get it perfect, then we struggle because we're trying to create this point solution. We can much more easily create things that say there's a, a 84% chance that there's low bone density in this patient of a 72% severity, just very general information. And without showing that to the physician, we can use that to go and actually organize the clinical information for the physician that would start to be a delighter, right? So we've, I think that the first step in, in doing this match is to match pixel-based and structured clinical content because unstructured would be too hard and to do a very narrow search. Then from there, we give the physician access to all of the clinical content and to the extent they take the time to do it, we've got to start learning from physician interaction data because they all care about different things. So we'll, we'll fail if we don't wrap the physician in the right information, and that's different for every doctor. So I think that's why we haven't you know, really moved the dial, but with these technologies, if we started to try to be less perfect and more informative and use pixel-based to inform structured clinical content, that actually fits in the clinical work uh, better than a point solution. I also think other things like trial matching where if we have you know, better data and better automated measurements, we can start to suggest patients for clinical trials where otherwise it's too much paperwork, they get rejected, it's not worth it. The submission rates versus the acceptance rates are quite different. So there's very strong ROIs uh, on that. And also on clinical variation management that you can start to just measure what you're doing, measure what you're looking at, and look at how that compares across outcomes of similar patients, actually group the cohorts after the interpretation and use those cohorts to start looking at what is the progression or regression of disease or the clinical outcomes or the cost or the readmission rates. So I think there is a big data play here that sort of maps across all of these things. So I think increased use of machine learning and a different use of pixel-based um, would make more sense to sort of fit something into what we have today uh, in a PAC system. Yeah, it, it really opens up the, the scope of where AI could, could play a role once you start to combine the clinical data with the, with the pixel data. Absolutely. And I think it would be a delighter. You know, if you want explainability, if you want adoption, we have to start getting a wow factor. We have to start delivering a few times where they say, that was cool, that was great, right? Um, and I just don't think we're hitting that mark uh, often enough or in some cases at all for doctors. So, Kevin, I think, I think an, you had some thoughts. Yeah, I think there's a another way we can also think about this, right? If if you look about the if you look at the overall life cycle of AI, we're it's still very new, uh, very young, and when you think about this evolving over the next three, five, even ten years, and think about where this may go and how we're thinking about it, right now a lot of this discussion is around technology and AI as a as a point solution. Each one of these algorithms as a as a one off that needs to be tied together. We could change the paradigm a little bit and think about this from the patient's perspective and think about where AI is going to evolve to and how that impacts the patient. So take, for example, risk scoring, right? You could think about risk scoring as strictly a technology solution that each score that's provided by each algorithm is just one piece of, of technology. But you could also think about it from the patient's perspective in their overall healthcare, uh, their lifetime of healthcare that each of these risk scores becomes a tool for them to help manage their healthcare. So now when you begin to look at this holistically and think about, to, to Jeff's point, how you tie all this other data together, if we think about it from that patient's perspective, we should be thinking about how do we tie AI into this, into the patient's hands to give them more power and more value in controlling their own healthcare destiny. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I think maybe for the, for the audience that some of this might be new, you know, there's a difference between matching clinical information to an AI powered imaging insight and using machine learning, which is deep learning is a form of machine learning, using machine learning just to process data about the patient and map it to what's working, what's not working, what matters, what doesn't matter. And I love the point, uh, Kevin, that, you know, we got to get to the point of care. Like if we need to solve that and that will inform how to create a holistic enterprise solution. The solution otherwise built in radiology will itself always be an enterprise point solution unless, uh, unless we do that. So, I mean, I think we're missing the short putts because we're, we're very focused on finishing the way we started. And I think we need to, um, we need to pivot in some cases pretty dramatically. 
I'll, I'll give a, an example of um, one, another project that we did in partnership with, with the AL. And uh, yeah, I, uh, very importantly is yeah, the ability to um, capture data that is not only just uh, imaging, but let's say for like patient characteristics um, and other forms of annotation. Um, and so the example here is uh, it's a multi-site collaboration uh, led by Yale, it's called COVID-Star COVID Visage Archive. Um, and it was, uh, so it's intended to be a technical template and approach for uh, multi-institutional research. Um, first, we're starting with uh, re uh, research around COVID and then this could be applied to other disease domains. Um, and so in this repository, we have um, a collection of um, uh, COVID-19 positive and negative cases that include not only just uh, CT and chest X-ray images, but it also provides the ability for annotations uh, using Firebase web forms that leverage lung coding. Um, all that to say is that uh, these annotations are very well organized and importantly, they're searchable. Uh, and so this is a huge step up from what traditionally is done in research where you've got your images on one side, you've got an Excel spreadsheet on your other monitor and you're trying to map these two together, uh, rather tedious. <laughs> um, and the, uh, the web form, it can include additional annotations, uh, including patient characteristics and uh, imaging feature descriptions. And so uh, in the case for uh, this study, uh, we include things like, for example, the degree of consolidation um, and also the ability to include free text. Um, so I think that's one possible solution uh, that we've that we've been leveraging uh, using some of these interoperability standards in order to capture that data uh, and to be able to uh, share it very easily. That's a, a really interesting paradigm. And I think, you know, one of the few silver linings of, of COVID is how it has impacted uh, our interest in, and focus on collecting uh, high quality data with annotations and additional metadata about the patient to really drive uh, AI development. So there's the, the large consortium, uh, the MIDRIC consortium, which is a, a multi-society, multi-institutional collaboration uh, that is also working uh, towards collecting not only imaging data, but also patient data uh, and uh, generating annotations to to create a really nice, robust data set for uh, AI research and development. Uh, and it actually kind of lends itself really nicely to uh, this next question, which is for you, Travis, which is uh, about building uh, high quality training data. You know, it's so critical to, to have that kind of data to build a well-performing AI model, but, but how do we get enough so-called good training data that is not only expertly labeled, but also representative of a diverse patient population, given all the challenges that we have in the U.S., especially to, to data sharing. Great. Well, thank you. You know, um, and as you might have guessed from some of my comments and, and questions earlier, we come at it from the back end of the process, um, you know, helping our research customers develop AI models and test them and iterate across them and, you know, and improve, improve on them. Um, so the way we, we think there's a transformation in the, in the kind of healthcare informatics world that's required. And we're set, you know, we've set about to deliver solutions to do this, but it's basically, um, the notion that you need a, a, a way to, um, first off, get the, all the different point information, imaging, EMR, genomics, EEG, whatever else, else is relevant, you know, kind of the multimodal data, get it into one place. Uh, where you can track it, organize it in cohorts, um, and manage that over time, and and sort of get that more holistic perspective on the uh, on the subjects or patients in this case. Um, so so we think there's a new infrastructure required, and that's of course what we do. Um, so you know so the the and so the challenges are of course that uh, you know there's the I guess the opportunity and the challenge. The opportunity is there's a lot of data. Um, in, in each of these health systems and particularly in research institutions that you know, are associated with health systems. Um, the challenge is getting that data out quickly enough and at enough scale to support the various AI development initiatives um, and then all the steps along the way. So, you know, depending on who you talk to and you guys can comment here, but, you know, estimates are, you know, roughly 80% of the AI development problem is the data management. 
And that comes in a variety of forms, you know, extracting the data, um, de-identifying data, um, curating data, labeling, classifying, you know, annotation, reader studies, you know, those types of things. So what we've tried to do is approach this as to say, well, look, we want a holistic view of our subjects and cohorts. Let's let's pull that together and and then provide the the necessary tools to quality check and curate and organize the data, not only for the immediate task at hand, but to track the various iterations and then for reuse and sharing. Uh, because because you don't want to do that heavy lift just to develop one model and turn out that you know somebody down the hall is trying to do you know something some you know related with the same data, so um, so that's the first part of it and and that's a big lift in its own right but you know we're finding that to be very successful in terms of helping the AI researchers you know get their hands on the data and, and work through that process more quickly, but in the long run there's a lot of domains that that are um, not, it's not sufficient to train on a very small set. You know, the cohort in New York might be different than the cohort in Florida, and you might need a very large population to actually get something that's general enough. So um, federated training uh, and the ability to um, enable organizations, uh, health system to keep their data, but enable them to collaborate with others by sharing the model and improving that model um, over time is, is something we see as being very important. And so if you kind of think about what we're doing is we're sort of adapting the data and making it available in an environment where training can occur. And then if we connect these institutions where federated training, you know, under the right controlled circumstances can happen, then everybody can have access to more data without actually having to physically send the data around. Um, and uh, we, that's sort of how we see it evolving. You know, there's many steps along the way. And the first step, of course, is, you know, just being able to get your data, you know, out of your packs and your EMR and, you know, wherever else it comes from and, and organizing it into cohorts and, you know, and curating and so on. Um, but at the end of the day, what we see is uh, a new set of uh, infrastructure, you know, that pulls everything together and then enables uh, you know, multi-institutional collaboration in a secure and private uh, private way. And there's a lot of twists and turns that are coming, you know, there's, you know, it's new, it's very early in the, in the context of the federated training, but the technology for getting that data and organizing it and scaling, you know, search and reuse and reproducibility and all that kind of thing, um, you know, is here today. And we're, you know, we're seeing that, that, that model working pretty well. And then on top of that, you have all of the, the at least in the US, you have HIPAA in, in Europe, you have GDPR, you have all of the regulatory sort of limitations that uh, you know, that some may see as discouraging data sharing. And so we yeah. have those hurdles to. to yeah, absolutely. And, the, and this federation model that I mentioned actually kind of helps address a lot of that in the sense that the data locality requirements uh, imposed by a lot of the European uh, environments and GDPR in general is, you know, is you're not supposed to send the data from your home environment, basically. So the data has to stay in place anyway. So if you can enable your collaborators to at least you know, um, uh, have algorithms analyze the data and get the byproduct of that without actually having to transfer the, the data itself or expose any, you know, personal protected health information. That's the big advantage of being able to do that. And of course, you know, a big part of it internally, you know, a lot of, we spend a lot of time on de-identification tools and, you know, all the, the things that you need to do to comply with HIPAA and GDPR as, as part of the infrastructure. So the, the basic approach is get all the data in one place enable the researchers to focus on their AI, track everything, iterate, score, you know, evolve. Um, and then we try to, you know, do the best we can to take it, you know, take the messy IT and, you know, related, you know, kind of uh, governance challenges and, and make that scale for them. Uh, and so, but I think in the long run, we're going to see a big transformation from, you know, uh, AI and, and research generally as being kind of, you know, ad hoc boutique kind of activity and being much more mainstream because of the factors we just talked about. A couple of things to, to add to that, Travis. So, so um, you know, the promise, I 100% agree that the promise of federated learning is, is incredible from the point of view of uh, being able to specialize algorithms as well to the local circumstances. Yeah. So, so you know, whatever your facility or practice happens to be your case mix and being able to, if there's a federated learning structure in place that allows you just to then specialize or train it on your data in a way that naturally extends the way it was already trained, which is very exciting. I think the, the discussion about data in general is interesting, though, for us, too, that, that um, because, you know, here we are as curators and 
experts, industry experts, and, and we recognize a big data problem. Uh, from the point of view of uh, the kind of uh, a radiologist who's not a machine learning or deep learning expert, you know, if we think there's a problem, then it's clearly a problem for end users to be able to recognize when a model's been trained well or not, you know, because it's, 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 if you're not an expert in this area, it's very difficult to know that. So I think there's an area of development for the industry as well, which is to put some structure or some standardization around how you, how you measure the performance of these algorithms and how you, in a standard way, because I think we all know that today vendors aren't comparable. You can't compare the sensitivities, specificities, et cetera, that you hear from vendors. So there's another important development area, I think, for the industry there. Right. Well, just one point we've tried to address in everything that we do is uh, extensive provenance on every you know step of the process. So if you're curating or, or running pipeline steps, training, models, everything is tracked at, at your great in great detail. So you can always go back and say, this version of this model was trained on this data set and you know th that kind of uh, thing. Um, it, but it's, it's really critical. Um, and you know, you, then you have to go for FDA approvals and you know, depending on where you are, you know, various levels of audit readiness and uh, that type of thing. It, it's absolutely a, a, a critical uh, element. And you know, there's, you know, there's many standards you know, or lack of standard broadly um, uh, in terms of how all that happens. But, you know, we're, we're at least trying to capture the, the required information. And then, you know, with the idea that you can do it consistently across many projects at scale, and then maybe you can start to get some standardization effectively, at least at your organization level. You know, we were talking about, uh, we, we raised the question of standards earlier as well, when we were talking about visualization of AI results. And I meant to mention that uh, the two IHE profiles that were developed last year uh, were both related to uh, AI results, both reporting of results and uh, uh, display of results. And so those standards are, are developing. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the things I guess that we, uh, one of the next areas of focus perhaps should be standardization of, of AI benchmarks across different products, which would be a very, uh, a very valuable thing for, for the customer to have. Uh, yep. We have uh, any last thoughts on this topic? Because we have a, a nice list of questions here coming from the audience. Yeah, I can be really quick, but you know, one interesting insight I can provide is we, you know, I uh, it was funny just picking up on what Conrad said. So, so sort of opposite experience, right? We're living in the training of pixel-based models, and you know, it turns out that the data curation isn't that big of a problem. It's you need a small number of very well labeled data sets. So I'm starting to focus on the prospective curation of the data in the clinical workflow because I can control exactly what I'm getting. And for example, there are sites that do, you know, 30 endographs in a week, right? Well, that's enough to train a great model in a month. And you can make a great model in maybe a month for a first version. So I think that uh, when you're when we're looking at a broad federation model, I think for big data and for machine learning, that works great. When it looks, when, when you're looking at imaging data, the acquisition and all of the different parameters of the study are so specific that um, you know it's almost better to think about collecting the data that you need where you know you can get it or in a diversified set of locations and then making sure it's pristinely labeled. And for customers, make sure the future value of your data is high. I mean, when we're curating this data, honestly, a lot of it is a mess. Uh, it's just, it never was, was, was you know, archived with the thought of being used for the purpose that we're trying to use it for. And I guess my last comment on this to you, Travis, would be in complete support of your statement that 80% of the work is, uh, is in the data. Um, the other half is in the data. Um, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, data is a very big issue and getting it right is critical. You know, we've collected about 10 million records, um, over the years that we've been aggregating data and it's, it, it's challenging. Um, while we can collect data in real time, Jeff, like as, as you're referring to, one of the things that we run into that has to be paid attention to, and a lot of doctors will ask us, well, if you're, are you retraining your algorithm in real time? And, uh, you know, if you're, if you're processing mammograms, for example, right now, are you retraining the algorithm with every new mammogram you see? And the problem is, and, and I'm not sure people on, uh, on, in the audience are aware of this, is that from a ground truth perspective, you have to know what your gold standard is. So for example, if you're dealing with a biopsy confirmed cancer, well, at the time you've collected the image, you don't have biopsy confirmation that that's a cancer. So just because you've collected that image, 
doesn't make it valuable in training or testing or evaluating the algorithm. You may have to wait three months for that patient to come back, have a biopsy, have the results, have that clinical data then uploaded in to the system to be able to then utilize that one image um, within training or testing or validation. So the, the whole life cycle of a record, whether pixel-based or otherwise within a system is critical to understand within the context of AI and putting that all together is, is important because you have to create more than just the training data to your point, Conrad, you have to create that testing and efficacy data, right? You have to be able to demonstrate not just that you've trained this on a demographically diverse set of patients, but that you've tested it on a similar set of patients so that you can prove that this will generalize once you take it out into the world. Yeah, if I might comment just quickly, I totally agree with this point because it, the, the use case for uh, the data itself, uh, you know, you know, drives a lot of what, how much, you know, how broadly you can select from existing data and so on. Uh, you know, uh, so for example, certain quality applications um, can generalize, and so ontologies that sort of, you know, can generally identify, you know, these are T1 weighted structural images with certain characteristics might be good enough for a, a general algorithm uh, of that type. But if you get in, as you get very domain specific, you're, you're spot on the, the exact nature of the data acquisition and study can, you know, and even, you know, data of the same type broadly across different vendors might have different characteristics and, and so on. And you got to be super careful about that. But so the, anyway, that leads to a whole topic on ontologies and classification and, you know, we, we can come back to that <laughs> another time. A webinar for another day, perhaps. Yeah, probably so, yeah. <laughs> so oh, I, I want I want to get to a couple of these uh, these audience questions. Um, there's a, a question here uh, from Sean, uh, who says that uh, integrating AI into enterprise workflow is not necessarily, quote unquote, revolutionary. Uh, think about enterprise workflow and collaboration tools like Slack. They provide seamless integration to hundreds of third-party tools and apps, including AI, within the primary workspace, um, but are not standalone. So one would have to imagine that it's PACs and or reporting vendors that must solve these issues. Comments from all of you. I, I, I think I would agree with the conclusion a little bit, but I, I think there's a, a an additional point I think I would add there on, which is, and I, I come at this as a little bit, as, as a, my original training was as a software engineer. And, um, and I, it's easy to forget the investment that exists in the design of PAX workstations today. And, you know, there's a reason why they've all converged to look quite similar. It's because that design has got quite optimal for what they, what people do. Now, I, I think it's certainly true that there could be a disruption coming, but there's also a danger of throwing out the baby with the bathwater and, and, and completely changing the design of a PAX workstation that actually has served people pretty well. So I think I think the idea of building it into the PAX workstation and then iterating and building from there is is actually very valuable. And, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, the point that was made um, is completely valid. I think there is a horizontal informatics layer that is just missing in healthcare, you know, if you think about Salesforce, you can build on Salesforce. You can you can plug apps in. Um, we've all, everyone talks about apps like the iPhone App Store. I don't know why that analogy took off because it's not very accurate. But much more accurate would be that you can have content and solution providers that are able to use open interfaces of healthcare, whether that's for data or that's for imaging. And none of us have anything to plug into. So all of us have to build all of the front end and back end of a solution. That's why we're ending up with point solutions. There's definitely an aggregation play and a platform play opportunity uh, here that would solve a lot of these problems, I think. And uh, a question here from Don. Many discussions about AI-based applications and automation in general cover improvements to productivity, which is important. Quality, though, is another important aspect. What role will the radiologist play in the future in evaluating the clinical effectiveness and quality of outcomes? Uh, for example, are they structured, consistent, accurate, timely uh, of these AI-based applications in medical imaging? Are there any new skills that we need to be teaching radiology residents today that will help with this? If I could jump in on that, I think that that goes back to that whole thinking around the partnership between AI and radiologists. I mean, what's AI doesn't work in a vacuum. Um, we're not at a point yet technologically where 
the patient or the doctor just blindly trusts it. And so the doctor has to take a very, not a passive role, actually, a very active role in this. When we work with hospitals and, and, and healthcare systems, we've been around for a long time. We are still tested every single time we walk in the door. They want to, even though we've, we've got FDA clearance, they want to see it run on their data, on their patients. And I think that that's, for now, wholly appropriate. And I think the doctors do need to take an active role in helping to define what are the standards by which AI algorithms are measured by testing it within their clinics to ensure that what has been um, promised has been delivered. Um, just because you've published research on something and said that your results are through the roof and amazing doesn't necessarily mean it applies in truth, in practice, in the wild, um, and, and, and your algorithm is generalized. So I think that that partnership between AI and the radiologist is critical um, to the success of, of the clinic, the doctor, and the patient. I think yeah. I agree with that 100 percent and I think there's um, uh, the, the, well as that classic the discrepancy between algorithm performance Kevin which I think you were referring to versus versus how does an algorithm perform when paired with a human being in a real context when they know they're not being watched and so on and uh, then you, you get all these all these challenges like automation bias and so on that actually give you contradictory results. And it's really important, I think, to, to the original question about are there new skills we need to be teaching uh, radiologists? And I think an understanding of, of the validation and, and the data, you know, not full data science courses, but, but some level of data science understanding around these things so that you can, so that radiologists are able to assess that. And as an industry, we're able to come up with standards for ver verification validation, I think is really important. Well, and one more short point. I, I think that the other thing that should be taught to new radiologists is that AI is here, right? It's not actually a flash in the pan. It's not going away. And whether we consider it a, a point solution technology or a holistic solution for the patient, it's going to be here and it's going to be here for a while. So the more that the doctors can actually begin to embrace that and, and figure out how to leverage it into their practice, um, I think that's that's where it's going to become more and more powerful. The more that our customers can drive us and tell us what they need to provide better care to their patients. And that's going to start in, in medical school, moving all the way forward. I think this is, this is the future and, and we, need to, we need to embrace it and help the doctors to embrace it as well. Yeah, I think one of the really uh, neat things that we're doing with Yale together and um, given that I'm also a PI for an NIHR on grant is that we're doing things in partnership, right? And so uh, it's a combination of really three groups coming together. So we have uh, the radiologist who is going to be the one that is identifying the clinical need. Um, we have data scientists, the engineers, the computer scientists who are able to uh, put together uh, these really powerful AI algorithms, be able to train them. Um, and also the participation of industry, being able to take uh, these prototypes that have been developed um, and then take them, be able to take it through regulatory clearance so that there can be dissemination uh, into uh, other hospitals. Um, and so at, at Yale, for example, one of the very uh, common things that we do in terms of evaluating what are, what are projects to pursue. Um, and this really wraps around uh, the uh, Institute for Healthcare Improvements aims, right? So it looks into, uh, does the end result of what I do, does it um, better the patient outcome? Does it lower the cost? Uh, does it improve the patient experience? And also, uh, does it improve the clinical experience as well? And if it checks all those boxes, then we say, hey, we think this is a really neat uh, uh, project to, to work forward on in partnership together. Uh, and at the same time, uh, that serves as a metric um, to measure the success of that AI algorithm um, in terms of its impact uh, to the hospital and to the patients. Uh, yeah, I think the the theme of that uh, that last discussion was really the importance of of the collaboration, right? I mean, not, we can't we can't do this in isolation, even within a practice. You know, as we start to think about which, uh, you know, what we need a solution for, what the needs are, AI or otherwise, uh, and to actually find the right one, you know, it's a collaboration within an organization, between an organization and, and industry partners. I mean, it's the reason we have, we're having this conversation. So I think that's a, a really good point. A uh, couple other questions here. So 
getting back to uh, something that came up earlier about integration into the, the, uh, the workflow, uh, if, if radiologists demand that AI workflow should be native to the primary reading environment, uh, how can a third party platform be sustainable? So, well, um, I, you know, I think our view on that would be that uh, we, it can be done. The integration into an, into into the native viewing uh, environment can be done in a standards based way. You know, so we, we we've done the integration of various tools into PAX workstations, and we, what we'd love to see is a uh, you know a, a standardized set of here are the viewing requirements for a range of of AI tools. And I think you're always going to be behind the curve, right? There's always going to be new tools coming through that will be ahead of that curve. But I think that's possible to do for, for the, for the 80, 20, 80% of really valuable stuff. Um, and uh, you know, that's something that we'd like to look at. We work on with some partners and I think it's something that would really benefit the industry because uh, each vendor could then integrate, you know, create one set of features in their viewers, knowing that they'd be compatible with a whole range of tools right off right off the shelf. I think it, I think what you said uh, earlier, Tessa, is probably the answer, and that is that we need standards at the findings level. Instead of trying to integrate technologies and get things working together, what we should do is have the AI models actually generating output that keeps the AI findings um, separate from the images so you can actually work with both and provide some of the confidence information, which generally they don't, in terms of you know, how sure they are about their severity and confidence of those findings. And with some simple standards in that regard, that solves many of these problems. You know, in, in Travis's case, it solves the problem of, okay, how can researchers work? Well, that all they need to do is just produce images and findings with these standards that we all understand. And then you could ingest these into any PAC system very natively. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, Personally, I'm very convinced that we have to stop trying to integrate, you know, solutions on the back end and front end and start creating compatible content for the physician. And that standardization can also help with um, what we brought up earlier, being able to take uh, the result of uh, algorithm number one um, and input it into uh, as the input, yeah, for algorithm number two. So having that interoperability, I think is, is super important. Um, and um, that also helps with um, uh, the sharing of the, the results. Um, and it, even with that sharing, it um, doesn't have to be within the, that same, um, let's say third party AI company, but imagine it hopping across multiple different, uh, not only AI companies, but also even uh, in-house built algorithms at uh, one's uh, hospital or institution. Uh, so that at the end of the day, um, there's a much uh, better, uh, there's a much more accurate diagnosis or uh, prediction of outcome to therapy response assessment. Uh, but having that tool set where, uh, because it speaks a common language, it's able to connect all together. Again, the, em emphasizing the, the importance for, for standards and, and at multiple points uh, in this process, for sure. Uh, question here. Uh, for Travis, but really for, for anybody else who would like to, to take it on as well. Uh, if you don't have much of an infrastructure in place for researchers who want to develop and uh, integrate AI into the radiology workflow, how do you get started? Um, yeah, the, the, the good news is you can kind of start and, you know, at sort of the lab level, uh, you know, uh, around a set of related activities or, you know, the technology exists to be able to scale, you know, scale up to truly global enterprise uh, level. Um, uh, but, it, you know, I, I think, you know, some of the points we touched on earlier, it really starts with what are your goals, um, you know, and, um, you know, and again, our, my bias, you know, and my, all my answers here has to do with, you know, development of AI models or new image processing techniques and related things. So I kind of, we live closer to the raw data and the, the development cycle there. Uh, but at the end of the day, you, you do, you know, need to understand what you're trying to accomplish. And, um, you know, so we have either specific algorithms or the idea that you're trying to set up an infrastructure to enable your team to, to innovate at that scale. Because if you go to a, a, a project today, you know, typically, you know, most research hospitals, it's like, you know, if you want to go get some data, you know, it's a lot of fun. Um, you get to go ask a lot of people for a lot of help and it takes a long time and it's very ad hoc. 
um, today. So, you know, what we think will happen and we're seeing it happen is that innovative institutions will start to see the need and the value of having a research infrastructure. And then, you know, it's a matter of saying, okay, let's start in a, in a domain that's going to add some value, whether it's around quality or, um, you know, or, or diagnosis of, you know, you know, brain, you know, Alzheimer's or something, you know, whatever it is you're doing, but focus there, you know, but make it systematic and anticipate that it's repeatable and scalable. That's, you know, and then, then the good news is the technology exists to, to truly scale it up. Yeah, I think that you, to your point, Travis, you need to ask, are you creating a project? Are you building something for a publication? Are you trying to create a product? Are you trying to create a company, right? I mean, so depending on what scale of uh, you're trying to accomplish here, you have to decide whether or not you want to go forth and build all that infrastructure in your company. I mean, you could look at Amazon or Google. Um, these guys have um, facilities online so you can stand up and run your own algorithms, upload your data, try out, use their GPUs, use their servers. So, I mean, if what you're trying to do is really just create a, a research paper or a project within your institution, I think that there's lots of tools online to be able to quickly, very quickly, get up, get running and, and play around with AI. If what you're trying to do is create a product or a company, I think uh, you need to do a deeper evaluation of the real lift that's involved in building a product. It's not trivial. It, it requires a lot of forethought and planning. It can be very costly. And, uh, and, and you may want to have that thinking around build versus buy. Um, you know, if you're really trying to create a product, is it really worth creating a product? Do you have something that markedly different? Or should you look at the marketplace that already exists you know, does the world need uh, one more algorithm in this space or is there already a good enough algorithm that you can bring in and apply to what you're trying to solve? Yeah, and Kevin, if you don't mind me just piling on a little bit there, I think, it, you know, there's also a, a scenario where you have an institution that says, I have a, a wealth of data. I have a, you know, a university and computer scientists and, you know, PhDs and MDs who are interested in that kind of collaboration. The challenge is they can't get their hands on the data you know, at any kind of scale and, and any one of those algorithms, as you point out, or, or, or challenge, um, that, that's also an opportunity, though, for, for these institutions, you know, how can they bring in more collaborations and, and, and funding and leverage the resources and innovation there, and data is at the heart of it. And, um, but what you don't want to see is every time you go for a grant, you spend all of your grant rebuilding basic plumbing and infrastructure that you know isn't scalable and sustainable because you don't typically build a model once you you build it and you rebuild it and you rebuild it and you rebuild it and then you build adjacent models and all sorts of things happen there so it's it's about scaling uh, and it's true in a product company it's also true in a research institution you know trying to innovate across their health system or or you know develop new IP to take to market um, anyway. Our last question I think for uh, for this conversation. Uh, we talked a little bit about automation bias and how very little uh, AI right now that's out there is intended to, to run independent of a physician. Uh, but, but looking far into the future, do you think that there will come a time where uh, imaging physicians' dependence on AI, if, if we even get there, will will impact how we understand the fundamental relationships between anatomy and physiology and the pixel appearance of disease. Well, that's I have a, no doubt. <laughs> that's yeah. a pretty broad question. Yeah. It is. <laughs> it's a big um, one. So, I mean, if I had to break that into two parts, um, basically, uh, will AI become autonomous at any point in the healthcare workflow? Um, I think that there's an opportunity for AI to evolve into an autonomous diagnostic in certain instances. I think, you know, you can look at models in healthcare going back decades, right? There was one point in time where if a woman thought she was pregnant, she went into her doctor for a battery of tests and, and then found out she was pregnant. Now, if a woman wants to know if she's pregnant, she goes and pees on a stick, right? So you have these diagnostics that a hundred years ago would have been um, science fiction that today are commonplace that you buy over the counter at the drugstore. And while we're talking earlier about hey, how AI may be new to the world today, as AI continues to evolve, as data becomes more prevalent and more ubiquitous, as models become stronger, there, there may be an opportunity, uh, maybe not in the full diagnostic setting, but in the screening setting um, prior to full diagnostic to 
provide some of that initial screening um, in a somewhat autonomous fashion. Um, you know, in the, going back to the analogy of pregnancy, that hasn't re replaced OBGYNs. They're not non-existent in the world. They are still existent. They still have a job and a function. Primary care physicians still have a job and a function. And a lot of that is still tying in with their patients. It's just that that one piece of that one diagnostic process has been automated into a, a diagnostic test. And that's just one example of hundreds or thousands of diagnostic tests that exist, um, whether they're, they're blood-based or saliva-based or whatever today that, that are, can be done in an automated fashion. So I do believe that there's the opportunity for autonomy in AI as it continues to evolve and strengthen over time. And, and I might add just in maybe just a quick point, but a trend we see is increased interest in the underlying raw data as opposed to rendered images, DICOM images for purposes of analysis. So it's you, so don't build your AI around an image that was designed for a human and all their limitations uh, uh, go to the data. The computer can read data. Um, so anyway, so there's an, we're seeing an increased interest in, uh, you know, certainly in, in, in uh, innovation around new pipelines and new methods and so on, you know, go, increasingly going directly to the, the raw data instead of, you know, going to the DICOMs, for example. I think that, uh, a quick uh, comment to that as well. So, sorry, Ming. Um, that the um, I think this is much a cultural medical question as it is a technology question. You know, I think to, to Kevin's point that uh, uh, there's certain in, within narrow scope. There's no no question that AI could be autonomous in places. You, know, you mentioned, I think, screening or risk risk prediction. But maybe another area is the, the whole idea of virtual biopsies, where you're looking for something very specific. Uh, but as long as you have this requirement to review the entire scan, uh, which is, I guess, is, a, is something that comes from the medical background, then, then you do, it's hard to be completely autonomous, I think, at that point. Uh, and, and so it'd be interesting to see whether the, the, the medical culture or the medical rules change as a result of what, what's possible to make autonomous from an AI point of view. I think a, a part that um, we think about often is the uh, explainability of AI. So let's take, for example, a heat map that's generated um, showing um, some <clears throat> uh, characteristic of a lesion. And uh, while that heat map may help to provide some level of confidence in terms of uh, its characteristics, um, I think at the end of the day, somehow that needs to be tied back to uh, the actual anatomy, physiology, uh, really the pathology, right? And so you've got um, the challenge, the standard almost of that threshold of, can you make actually a rad path um, uh, connection um, or is the heat map that is shown, is it just um, great Photoshop? Um, how can you really believe that what you see is really true? Um, and so I, I feel that um, as AI becomes more and more powerful, uh, there's also um, the need to tie that grounded to uh, the actual, yeah, literally the ground truth, the pathology of the disease. A, a couple comments. Um, you know, one one thing that I always think about with automation is just normal chest x-rays. And if you ask the questions, okay, uh, you know, how many people would trust it? How many, how many radiologists would want that? I imagine now it's probably something 60-40. I don't know which way it would fall, but it would be somewhere somewhere in that, um, in that range. However, you know, if we were to apply that tool in the peer review process and start to catch you know, normals or be able to show someone with that sort of peripheral vision that we're able to identify normals or show white papers we're able to identify normals, then that's a great step in automation because that's a very low value uh, sort of high velocity task that, you know, th that would, would make it understandable. When you think about examples where we combine things in a way never before possible, you can do different types of deformable fusions or you can do different types of overlays that really those are almost always done deterministically now and you can get a much, much better result. And that always, you know, I'm, I'm kind of fascinated with the, you know, the synthetic, uh, synthetic anatomy idea that if the neural net knows what normal is, then the neural net could actually sort of extract things out of your view that you didn't need to be looking at and would that actually improve the diagnostic confidence of the physician? So as soon as we start connecting the data and the imaging workflow and the algorithm together, we can actually measure what better is. And I think that's the answer to the question, can we make it better and why I'm certain we can. I'm certain we will see things that we should stop showing physicians so they can look at other things that are more important and we can measure that. 
um, that would be my definition of, of better. And, and on that note, uh, I, I think we would all agree that there is a uh, great promise for the future of AI in, uh, in medical imaging and uh, probably solutions to problems we, we haven't even actually thought of yet. Uh, I wanna thank you all for uh, your uh, robust discussion uh, today and thank you all to the audience. My apologies to those of you who asked questions that we didn't get to. Uh, again, uh, if you are interested in uh, claiming IIP CE credit, make sure to complete the post webinar survey. Uh, there was a, a question about uh, the recording, which uh, we did record the session and it will be available within the next seven to 10 days on the SIM website. So if you'd like to catch up on any parts of it, uh, it will be available to you soon. Uh, gentlemen, thank you all again for your, for your thoughts, for your participation, uh, for this great discussion. And thank you to the audience for joining us. Uh, everybody stay safe and we will see you all soon. Take care. <laughs>